I'm deeply grateful for that introduction and am moved by it because I knew Jim better than he thought. His wife's father used to be my father's veterinarian. I don't mean that my father was an animal. My father had a dairy farm, and the veterinarian that came to minister to the cows was, was Anne's father. It is a great delight and privilege for me to be here tonight and for Cliff Barrows to join two of our colleagues, Walter Smith and Irv Chambers, who keep us weekly and almost daily informed on the events of Coral Ridge Presbyterian. Now tonight I want you to turn with me to Hebrews, to Hebrews the twelfth chapter, for a very brief word. Disraeli once said that a speech to be immortal does not have to be eternal, and I intend to be brief in what I have to say tonight. The twelfth chapter of Hebrews, and I'm reminded of this text because I've been in Washington, D.C. all week, and I gave nine speeches in Washington this past week. I'll just tell you about a few of them. On Tuesday morning, I addressed the staff of the White House. Secretary Earl Brutz was in charge, and he introduced me. Then the next morning, I addressed the judges of the Supreme Court and all the judges of the District of Columbia. Judge Sirica sat to my right, and they said it was the largest gathering of judges that they'd had that they could ever remember, all at one time in the city of Washington. And all I did was give a straight gospel message. And all week long, we had 12,000 people at the Pentagon on Wednesday noon. The employees at the Pentagon. It's been a tremendous week, but I've heard a lot. I've felt a lot. I've seen a lot. And I'm convinced that we're living at a very critical moment in the history, not only of America, but the history of the world. And there are many people asking the question, will we survive as a nation? Can our world make it? Or is this the end? Are we living at the end of the age? What moment on God's calendar is this? The next five years will be turbulent, historic, tremendous, overwhelming years that you and I are going to live through. Our world will not be the same five years from now. More changes are going to take place in the next five years than possibly any five-year period in the history of this republic. And in this passage, the writer to the book of Hebrews that we think might have been the Apostle Paul, but we are not sure, said this. Yet once more, the Lord speaking, once more, I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. And this word yet once more signified the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. God said there's coming a day when I'm going to shake the world, but some things will not be shaken. Some things remain. You know, the word crisis is an overused word, and it's misunderstood. Webster defines it as decisive change. 
This is a period of political change. The Lord predicted that. He said, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. The word distress means to be pressed from all sides. The word perplexed means no way out. In other words, there's coming a time when the world will be pressed and there'll be no way out. Those times come in your life, in your home. Tension, friction, financial trouble. You're pressed and there doesn't seem to be a way out and a man this past week in Washington said, this week, every single day, I've thought of suicide. Pressed in his personal life, financial problems, family problems, pressing upon him, a physical problem, pressing upon him, no way out. And I was glad to tell him, as he stopped me in a hotel lobby, but there is a way out. There is an answer. There is a way. Jesus said, I am the way. This is a period of social change. It's a period of scientific change. It's a period of religious change. It's a period in which the whole world is changing. Look how the church is changing. Who would have ever believed the things that we're witnessing today in the church? In America, we see two things happening. The exorcist is showing in 25 cities to packed audiences. And I was in New York on Monday morning, going to Washington. And back of the hotel, as we swung around in the taxi, they came by a theater. 8.45 in the morning, Four and five deep, completely around the block to see the exorcist. Ambulances sitting there ready to take the people that would scream and yell and have their difficulties away to the hospital. Satan is at work in America, the occult. But there's also the movement of the Spirit of God as Bible study groups and Bible classes and churches everywhere are proclaiming the gospel and tens of thousands are being swept into the kingdom of God. I heard about a man that had gone to a Baptist church, and in the Baptist church they give an invitation usually in the Southern Baptist to come and join the church, and on this occasion nobody came, and this man was the worst man in the community, and he sat there and he was half under... He'd taken a couple drinks that morning and he felt so sorry for the minister that finally he staggered down the aisle. And he joined the church and they voted him right in. And the next Monday when he was sober, some of his friends came to him and said, you did a terrible thing. Joining that church when you know you don't live it and you don't mean it. He said, I know, I don't know what happened to me. He said, I just... I just felt so sorry for the minister, standing up there by himself, and nobody responding. I, I just had to go. He said, I'll, I'll undo it next Sunday. He said, I, I'll go and tell him. So the next Sunday, the same thing happened, and he came down the aisle. And he whispered to the minister, he said, I'm very sorry for what I've done. He said, I, I just can't tell you how sorry I am. And the minister turned and told the congregation the story and they voted him out of the church. He said, you know, this is a strange church. He said, I told a lie and they voted me in. I told the truth and they voted me out. <laughs> now that couldn't happen in a Presbyterian church. But in the midst of all this changing, there are some things that never change. Think of it a moment. What never changes? The nature of God doesn't change. God hasn't changed. He 
He hasn't changed to adapt himself to our generation. The scripture teaches, I am the Lord, I change not. Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should change. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. Every good and perfect gift cometh from above, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now that shadow of turning that James uses there is the bat of an eyelash. Do you know what my wife does when she watches CBS News? She counts the times that Eric Severide blinks. And one night she got 127 times. No kidding, she really did. Another thing she does, she listens to the news and she counts the different crises that they can put into the 30-minute newscast, which about a third of it goes for advertising, and she's gotten up to 22 different crises that they can present in that short time. No wonder people are uptight and popping pills. The bat of an eyelash. God doesn't even change that much. God doesn't change according to the latest theological theories of some of our theologians. God is unchanging. I am the Lord God, I change not. God is unchanging in his holiness. God is a holy God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and which is and which is to come. God is holy and God demands holiness in his creatures. I was asked by a judge this week in the question and answer period, can you give us a definition of sin? And I said, yes, sir. Sin is coming short of God's requirement. It's anything less than perfection, anything less than moral perfection. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us has a little bit of Watergate inside. We're all guilty of coming short of God's holy requirements. And we're all sinners and we're all in need of the grace and mercy of God. And that's why the Lord Jesus came and died on the cross. He died for your sins. He died for mine. And God took your sins and laid them on Christ. God changes not in his holiness. And let me tell you, because he is our holy God, he is also unchanging in his judgment. There is a judgment day coming. Our God is a consuming fire. We forget the judgment of God and we don't like to hear sermons on judgment and hell. The world is seeing hell on the motion picture screen. They're talking about hell. They're talking about the devil. They're talking about judgment. But we're not hearing it today from the pulpits. The Bible is filled with stories of judgment. Our Lord talked more about hell than he did heaven. There is a day of judgment coming. God is a holy God. And you and I are going to stand there naked, our whole lives on the screen, our thoughts, our intents. And when I stand there, I'm not going to ask for justice. I'm going to ask for mercy. I need mercy. I need the grace of God. I need the forgiveness of God. And I want to tell you a wonderful thing. God loves you and he offers you tonight forgiveness and he offers you mercy tonight right tonight february the 3rd 1974 god can forgive every sin you've ever committed god can wipe the slate clean because of christ not because you deserve it for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't buy your way to heaven. God is unchanging. He's unchanging in his love. God loves you. That's the most wonderful thing to go to bed with at night, to know that God loves me. God forgives me. God is interested in me. But I must receive him. 
Secondly, the word of God does not change. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I settled that a long time ago. There are a lot of things in this Bible I don't understand. There are questions you could ask me that I cannot answer. I don't know all the answers in this book. How can a finite mind like mine comprehend the infinite? I cannot. So one day I opened the Bible and I said, Oh Lord, I accept this as your word by faith. And that settled it from that moment on. When I quote the scriptures, I know that I'm quoting the word of God. It's a living word. And I've put this proposition to many a person. I say, take the Gospel of John and read it through two or three times and see what happens. I spoke to the black clergy of the city of Washington this past week. Had about a three hour rap session with them. And it was a marvelous experience for me. And one of them came up to me afterward. He had a clerical collar on. He was pastor of some church. I've forgotten the name of it now, but he's a bishop and a pastor. And he said, Dr. Graham, I heard you say that several years ago at a seminary. I think he said Princeton Seminary. And he said, that settled it for me. He said, I went back to my room and he said, I took that Gospel of John and he said, I read it three or four times, just the Word of God without any commentaries, without anything. And he said, at that moment, I'd never really made a commitment to Christ. He said, I wanted to serve God, but I'd never really committed. And he said, that word changed me. It's a living word. The living word of God. And it does not change. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And then another thing, the third thing that does not change is human nature. And that's the reason we're not going to have peace in the world. We're not going to have a generation of peace unless God intervenes. Because you see, you cannot build permanent peace on a cracked foundation of human nature. As long as there's lust in the world and greed in the world and hate in the world, you're going to have the possibility of war. And what are the nations doing now? In order to get oil, France and Britain and America and the others are sending huge amounts of armament to small nations around the Persian Gulf. But we're also sending lots of arms through Latin America and all over the world. The whole world is arming. There's never been such an armament race in the history of mankind. And those preachers in 1937 and 38 and 39 that warned the world were laughed at. We said we're on the verge of a great peace and already Hitler's legions were marching. I can hear the tramp, 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 tramp now of the marching legions of World War III. And anybody that doesn't face it with reality is a fool. The world is arming, human nature filled with violence. How many times this past week have we read in our papers of someone that just took a gun and shot another person? Look at the killings in Oakland in San Francisco this, in the last few days. Almost every city you go to, the headlines are screaming of violence on a scale we've never known in civilized communities before. Human nature is just as violent as it ever was. It hasn't been changed. Jeremiah said long ago, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In traveling all over the world, in Africa and throughout Latin America and throughout Asia and throughout Europe and throughout the islands of the sea in North America, we found the human heart is the same, whether it has a black skin or a white skin. Whatever its cultural background, whatever its language, it's the same. And it's in need of salvation. It's in need of redemption. It's in need of transformation. It's in need of cleansing. And that's the reason our Lord said you must be born again if you're to enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't get into the kingdom of heaven with that old evil nature of yours. You must have a new nature. And God says, I'll provide the new nature if you'll put your faith and trust in my son. Human nature has not changed. 
And lastly, the way of salvation has not changed. All these centuries, the way to the kingdom of God is exactly the same. Peter said it long ago in the fourth chapter of Acts, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Have you come that way? In the last generation, the only way to the kingdom was through Christ. In this generation, the only way to God will be through Christ. The only one in history of whom it is written, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. My last sentence. He will never change. But you must change. Have you been changed by the power of God and the touch of Christ? Well, you say, what do I have to do? It's so simple that people stumble. It's not complicated. It's so simple that a blind man can believe, and a deaf man can believe, and a dumb man can believe, and a lame man can believe, and a black man, and a white man, and a yellow man, and a red man. All you have to do is first repent. That means that you say, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I'm willing to turn from my sin. Secondly, receive by faith Jesus Christ as your only Savior. By faith. You cannot understand it all intellectually. Forget that for the moment. Come by simple childlike faith and say, Lord, I don't have much faith. It's smaller than a mustard seed, but I believe. And then say, Lord, I'm going to follow you and serve you. And then when you say that, you're saying to yourself, but I can't hold out. I... No, you can't. But he'll do the holding. All you want to do tonight is say, I commit. And there's this card right there. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and say tonight, I recognize that I am a sinner. I need the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I now repent of my sins and trust Him as my personal Savior and Lord. And as He gives me strength, I shall live for Him, witness for Him, and seek to serve Him in the fellowship of his church. Now that doesn't mean you're joining this church. It means that you're receiving Jesus Christ into your heart and life. Now let us bow our heads. Our Father, we thank thee for the changeless message of the gospel at a time when it seems the whole world is crumbling round about us. We thank thee that we have a gospel to proclaim of hope and love and forgiveness. And we pray that those that have been listening might have been listening to another voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit. And may they come this night to make their peace with God and find His grace and love and mercy and forgiveness adequate for their lives. May young people receive Christ tonight and find new purpose and new meaning in their lives. And we pray that the Holy Spirit, the great follow-up agent, will follow them, encircle them, and help them, lead and instruct them. For we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.